Our scripture reading today will come from Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come up upon the Gentiles in Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Good morning. We have a wonderful gathering this morning, and I am so grateful for your presence. It is always a blessing and a privilege to be able to worship with you. And let me just say that this is the last sermon that I will be preaching to you in 2018. And I want to express my thankfulness and my gratitude for the opportunity that you have given me and Laura to be a part of your beautiful congregation. It has been a joy to get to know you, and hopefully we'll have much, much more time to continue to develop our wonderful relationships and friendships. Our theme for the year has been Be Transformed, and I've tried to look at several different ideas that will help us understand what the Bible means when Paul would say in Romans chapter 12, to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The last idea that I wanted to look at is the idea of being transformed through the gospel. Uh, As this is the last sermon that I get to preach to you for the year, and the reason for that is because our elders in their uh, deep wisdom have decided that you need to end the year with good preaching. And so tonight Ethan will be preaching, and then next week Ethan will be preaching again, and then the final sermon of 2018 will be a youth-led service. So you've got good preaching up ahead for the remaining sermons of the year. So this is the last sermon I get to preach, and I was thinking, what is the most important thing that I could express from God's Word? Um, And this is the most important, in my opinion. What every Christian needs to understand, and for those of you who are not uh, members of the body of Christ, maybe you've never been baptized into Jesus Christ, and you're contemplating the idea of Christianity, what does it mean, what is it talking about when it says you have to uh, obey the gospel, Uh, there's nothing greater, in my opinion, Then understanding correctly the beauty of the gospel. And in the gospel is the most incredible uh, power of transformation that God has given to us. And so this is what I want us to think about. How is it that the gospel brings transformation of life to individuals? In Galatians chapter 3 verses 10 through 14, this is not the only place that the Bible speaks of the gospel. But in my opinion, it does a wonderful job of blending together The Old Testament idea of law with the New Testament image of the perfecting of the law in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Galatians 3 verses 10 through 14 blends together beautifully for us the importance and value of the law of God with the beauty and the supremacy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in that we see God's power to bring about life transformation. And as we go through these few verses... I just want to look at three different ideas. Number one, what does law teach us? And Galatians 3 um, lays out the idea of the purpose and the value of law. Number two, what does the gospel teach us? And in this few uh, group of verses, we see the power of the gospel and what it is to be saved by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then we'll close by seeing how law and gospel bring about a transformation of life. And I'll ask you to be just uh, merciful to me this morning. I've got a cough drop in to make sure my voice continues. And so I want us to look at these verses and look at these three points. Let's begin by asking the question, what does law teach us? What is the value of the law of God? Uh, In verse 12, this is what we read. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. When you think about all of Scripture, 
And of course, law is a theme that goes from the Garden of Eden to the end of the Bible. Law is the concept of God being the sovereign ruler of all of his creation. And because he has the authority to be the sovereign ruler, and the only one who possesses that authority, he is the only one who has the right to say, this is how you shall live. This is how you shall not live. Don't do this. Do this. That's a law. That is God stepping in and saying, this is how my creation will live and flourish. God has the only right to uh, legislate divine law. And in the giving of law, the first thing we see is the goodness of God. Notice how verse 12 says, the man who does them shall live by them. Life is found in the law of God. For instance, Psalm 19 is an exposition of the power of revelation. And in verses 7 through 8, it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Nowhere in Psalm 19 does it say, The law of God is a burden that makes life miserable. In fact, it says the opposite. Because God has given us his word, and has shown us how we are to live, our lives are blessed through the giving of the law. Sometimes we, in an enlightened society, like to think the best life is the life where no one tells us to do anything. We have the right to decide everything we do with our lives, and that's what it means to live a free, a good, and a blessed life, is to have no one tell us anything. The Bible doesn't agree with that. The Bible says that God's law directs us into goodness, And because of the law of God, our lives are enhanced, they are blessed, and they are protected. Uh, A verse that illustrates this is going all the way back to the Garden of Eden. When God creates man, Genesis 2, verses 15 through 17 say, Then the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. It was paradise. Everything in the garden was created for man's good and his flourishing. The Lord God commanded the man. Notice, the giving of law. God is giving a standard. Do this and don't do this. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. Notice, in the command we see the blessings and the liberty far outweigh the restrictions. Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. You might look at that and say, well, what a terrible God to restrict man's ability to do whatever he wants. But the opposite is true. Notice, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. The commandment protects man from death. And when you read in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve doing whatever they want, in the rejection of the commandment of God, they bring sin and death into the world. And so the curses of disobeying God's law far outweigh what God desires for us to do in submitting to his will. So we see in the law... Uh, the teaching of God's goodness. In the law is life. The second thing we see is this. <clears throat> the law teaches us the righteousness of God. In verse 10, go back to our text, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10. It says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The second thing law teaches us is God's righteous character. In that he gives law, we see that he is going to uphold his law. He's going to bless those who keep it, and there is a punishment in the violation of law. We understand this concept. In fact, every civilized society is ordered on this understanding, that law is given to create boundaries that keep uh, blessings and life and flourishing possible. If you remove all boundaries and everyone has the right to do whatever they want, then ultimately evil will do whatever it wants, and the evil rights will overcome my right to live peaceably, quietly, and humbly. The problem with this idea that no one has the right to tell me anything is as soon as someone with more power than me comes along, I'm going to regret that idea. If everyone has the right to do whatever they want, whenever they want to, then I'm going to run across someone who's smarter than me and stronger than me. And they're going to say to me, I'm going to take whatever I want from you because no one has the right to tell me anything. God has laws in place because the idea of might makes right is a horrible way to live. 
and it leads to the destruction of humanity and misery and slavery. And so in the law, we see God's goodness and his righteousness. But in that he gave the law, he holds himself accountable to that law. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 10 says, he will punish those who do not obey it. And so God isn't just a kindly grandfather who says to his children, don't do this. And then when his children do what he told them not to do, he doesn't just say, oh, you, you know better. No, God is supreme authority. And so when he says, do not do this or you will be punished, God holds himself to the standard of righteousness and he upholds his laws and he governs justly. And that brings us to the idea of the word cursed in Galatians chapter 3. It shows up several times in our text and I'm sure you've noticed it. But just in verse 10 it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law. The curse points to the idea of the punishment of violating God's law. I don't want the curse of God. Because the curse is, you have violated God's law, therefore you will be judged by a perfect God. I don't want to have to stand before God and have him say, you violated my law, therefore I am bound to punish you. That's the curse. Being bound to the punishment that comes with violating the law of God. The law was designed to keep me from having to deal with that. If I uphold God's law, and I honor God's law, and I submit to his will, the curse is something that will be far from me. However, as we read through the Bible, we see no one has ever kept the law of God perfectly. Psalm 24, verses 3 through 5 say this, Who may ascend to the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That sounds good, right? Who will be able to stand in the presence of God? Well, a good person will be able to stand in God's presence. What's the problem? No one has clean hands and a pure heart. That's the problem. We might say, yeah, it's a beautiful verse. Who can stand in the presence of God? Well, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. That means there's no sin in their life. The problem with law is it blesses those who keep it perfectly, but in the violation of the law comes the punishment. And so God's righteousness is seen in the law, which leads to our need for humility. This is what the law teaches us. First and foremost, I must be humble before God. Because I cannot waltz up to God and say, I belong here because I'm perfectly clean in deed and in heart. No, every person struggles with what Galatians 3 calls the curse. Look at verse 10. Cursed is everyone who does not keep the law. Look at verse 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. Why would Paul say it's evident that the law doesn't justify? Well, this is what law does. It says, don't cross this line. If you do, you'll be punished. Then when we cross the line, what happens? God says, you deserve punishment. You deserve curse. That's what the law does. It points out the wickedness of sin, and it legislates the punishment. And that's what law does. Now, what do I have to understand? I have violated the law of God, and so have you. As Psalm 24 would say, I do not have clean hands or a pure heart. And so the law teaches me the goodness of God and my own sinfulness. That's law. Now, thought number two is, if that's what law is, God's goodness in trying to protect us and our foolishness in violating what he has said for us to do, what is my fate? Well, if all there is is law, I am deserving of punishment. Or, as Galatians 3 would say, I am under curse. I'm going to receive something bad. That's what curse is, right? You never hear curse and say, oh, this is going to be good, right? Uh, You never watch, say, I'm a big Harry Potter fan. Uh, You never hear of a curse in the books of Harry Potter and you think, oh, this is going to end really well. No, a curse is a bad thing. It means something evil is coming your way. It's a curse. Now, law says, here's the curse if you break the law. And we've all broken the law. And so the Bible says there is a curse that is coming to every human who violates the law. However, there's more to the Bible than just law. 
And this brings us to the idea that you see in Galatians chapter 3 of gospel. Gospel means good news. What is the good news? Well, the good news is there's more to God's plan of redeeming his creation than just giving us law. Because, as verse 11 would say, no one is justified by law. Law just points out sin and then condemns it. And so if all I am is under a system that points out bad, then I'm going to know very quickly how bad I am and then have nothing to do about it. But God is more than just a God of law. He is a God of grace. And that brings us to the idea of the gospel. What does the gospel teach us? Well, look at verse 13 of our text. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. In the first place, what does the gospel teach us? The beauty of Jesus Christ. Perfection. How do you see that in verse 13? Well, notice these words. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. The implication is, Jesus Christ could not redeem us from the curse of the law if he was deserving of it. Jesus Christ could not say to God, they are innocent because of my innocence, if he were guilty. And so when you read Galatians chapter 3 and you look at verse 13 and you see that Jesus Christ is going to take the curse of the law that belongs to each person and say, I will bear that curse myself so that those who have faith in me will not bear it. The implication is, do you see his perfection? Jesus Christ in no way sinned. He kept the law of God perfectly. Galatians 4, 4 says he was born of a woman born under the law. And everything Jesus did was honoring God under that law. In no way did Jesus step outside the boundaries of God's law. Instead, he honored them perfectly. Peter would say in 1 Peter 2, verses 22 and 24, that Jesus committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you are healed. Listen to that language. He did nothing wrong, and yet he is going to bear the penalty of the curse. For what purpose? Well, the second thing the gospel teaches us is not that we have a beautiful Savior, but that I am sinful. Think about the law of God. Have you ever kept it perfectly? I had an individual point out to me the most difficult law in all of Scripture is what the Jews would call the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That is the hardest commandment in the Bible. Why? When have you ever, in one hour of your life, fully, completely, totally loved God? When has every moment of your life been lived out so that God would be glorified through you? Have you ever done that? Loved God with all of your being. And yet when you look at Jesus Christ, what do you see? You see the only human being who walked this earth who loved God completely, perfectly, and in total submission to the will of his Father. And yet, Galatians 3, 13 says, he is going to bear my curse. Why would Jesus bear my curse? Well, the gospel says, because he in his perfection looked down from heaven and saw what? My imperfection. The gospel is not just good news because it says, look how beautiful Jesus Christ is. No, the gospel is good news because it is completely honest with each person. And when you and I open up God's word and we read the gospel, this is what we learn. We are far more sinful than we would ever like to imagine. We are far more sinful than we were really ever willing to admit. Because when I look at the cross, look at verse 13. For it is written, Galatians 3, 13 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Now what's that a reference to? Well, that's a passage from the law, Deuteronomy. And it's speaking to, in Galatians 3, Jesus Christ. Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. Well, the curse is reserved for those who violate the law. And yet, what do you see Jesus doing? He's bearing the curse. He's hanging on a tree and he's dying a brutal, miserable death. Why? Because he has committed such vile sins? No. Because I have, and so have you. 
When you examine the cross and you see the brutality of what Jesus endured, you see the blood that he shed, the pain that was inflicted upon him, the mockery that was thrown his way, all of those things illustrate, in the eyes of God, the wickedness of sin. You might look at your own life and you say, well, you know, I'm really not that bad of a person. I've never killed anyone, hopefully. Please don't tell me if you have. This is neither the time nor the place to deal with that. You say, I've never committed adultery. Never stolen anything. Never lied. Never mocked someone. Never spoke badly of someone behind their back. Wait a second, now it's getting personal. Sin in the eyes of God is something deserving of everything you see Jesus enduring on the cross. Sometimes we look at our lives and we say, well, I'm not that bad of a person. If you ever get to the point where you say, I'm not that bad of a person, you're not realizing from God's perspective the vileness of sin. Because Jesus went to the cross to bear a curse. And that curse is reserved for everyone who violates the righteousness of God in violating his law. And that's what we have done individually. Collectively, we've all sinned. And you see how God views sin when you look at the cross and you see the pain that he endured. This should help us from saying, well, you know, the sin that I have committed, it's not that bad. No, every sin took Jesus to the cross. Every sin is, quote, that bad. And so I am humbled by the gospel because Jesus in his perfect goodness goes to the cross and he experiences the curse. God looked at Jesus on the cross and says, every violation of the sin is going to be poured out on you. God looks at Christ and he says, curse you. And why does Jesus receive that curse? Why is God judging Jesus as vile and wicked, though he is pure? Because Jesus is bearing my curse. Look at verse 13. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree. But Jesus is innocent, yeah. He's bearing my curse. And so the gospel teaches us the beauty of our Savior and the ugliness of our own sin. And that leads us to the last idea here. In John 20, verses 30 and 31, John ends his book by saying, Truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe in Jesus, that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. The word belief in the New Testament and faith, generally speaking, are always a translation of the same Greek word, pistis, or pistuo. And so when you read the word belief, generally speaking, you're also reading the word that we've translated faith. And so it says, truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may have faith, is the idea. That you read the gospel and you would have faith in who Jesus Christ is. That you may have faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What is the gospel? He's perfect. I am a sinner. And he went to the cross for me. Now watch what Galatians 3 says. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's us. You haven't kept every law of God. You're under curse. Verse 11. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident for. Now here's an Old Testament quotation that shows up multiple times in the New Testament. For the just shall live by what? Faith. Faith. Keep reading. Verse 12. Yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by him. Notice the idea. How does law call a person just before God? Law will only call a person just in the sight of God if that individual has never violated the law. That's all that law can do. If you keep it, you'll live. However, what does Paul say? Yet the law is not of faith. The law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessings of Abraham might come upon the Gentile in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? Through faith. 
Notice three times in Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, we see the power of faith. And what is it that the gospel does? It speaks to our heart and shows us the beauty of Jesus. It shows us our own sinfulness. And then it says, in our sinfulness, Jesus took my curse on the cross. Do you believe it? Faith. Do you believe how sinful you are without Christ? And yet, because of what Christ has done on the cross, he is offering the chance that all of the curse that is due to me because I have violated violated the law would be placed on my Savior so that I could stand before Jesus and God at the last great day justified. What gives me the ability to say I am just in the sight of God? Well, what does Galatians 3 say? It's the word faith. It's the acknowledgement of my sinfulness and the goodness of God and that my sins were placed on Christ on the cross. Do you believe that? Now, what do we most often readily believe in? Well, we look at verse 12 and we say, this is what I believe in. I have done enough good. Therefore, I'm going to heaven. But that's not the gospel. That's just another system of law. And the problem is, when I get to the point where I think I'm going to heaven because I've done enough good, then I'm placing the power of salvation on my own ability to keep another law. And what does Paul say? That's not where justification comes, through the keeping of the law. The justification of God comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every sin that I have and will commit is placed on the cross of Calvary. And only because Jesus went there do I have the right to say, I am saved, I am redeemed. That's what the gospel teaches us, the power of faith. And notice the object of the Christian's faith is not himself. I do not look at myself and say, now I am good enough to stand before God. Now I can ascend the hill of the Lord, my hands are clean and my heart is pure. No, the gospel says I am good enough because my Savior tells me in him I am justified. That's what the gospel teaches us. And that brings us to our final thought. We're going to skip this for the sake of time. How does law and gospel bring about transformation? Turn with me to Titus chapter 2. Let me read these verses, 11 through 14, and we'll close. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous of good works. When I understand what law does and the beauty of the gospel... How does my life begin to change? Number one, sin becomes vile. Because I'm going to understand God made those laws for my own good. And me, in my own pride, I walked beyond God's boundaries. And I am deserving of curse. And yet, the curse falls on Jesus. And so does a Christian look at sin and say, it's no big deal. Jesus is just going to take care of it on the cross anyways. What's the big deal of sin? No, When you understand God's law and the beauty of the gospel, sin becomes serious. And this is when life transformation begins to happen. When a Christian says, yes, every sin is going to be dealt with by my Savior. However, I will loathe every one of them. Because when I look at the cross, what do I see? My guilt. I see the perfect love of Jesus saving me over and over again from my sin. And when the love of God touches your heart, sin doesn't become something you take easy or lightly. Sin becomes vile because I see every pain that Jesus endured is something I put upon him. And so I begin to change. Notice verse 14 of Titus 2. He gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people. Law and gospel purifies you from sin because it confronts you with the wickedness of sin. Number two, grace becomes beautiful. Notice what it says. The grace of God, verse 11, that brings salvation has appeared to all men. When you look at Jesus Christ, do you see something beautiful? 
you will see something beautiful when you understand your own sin and how readily Jesus said, no, Father, don't curse them, I'll bear it. The gospel becomes beautiful when you see the cross is where you and I deserve to be. And yet Jesus says, no, you don't go there, I go there. That's grace. I heard one preacher explain grace in an acrostic. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. Why am I saved? Why am I redeemed? Why is heaven my eternal home? Because Christ suffered the curse so that I might receive the blessings of God. Grace becomes beautiful when you understand the gospel. Number three, the gospel becomes good news. What do you do with news? You hoard it for yourself, right? Ah, this is news. I will keep it. No one will know. No, the nature of news is it is to be shared and told to other people. When you understand what Jesus has accomplished on the cross for the world, what should a Christian life become? A spreader of good news. That's life transformation. When I see myself deserving of sin and my Savior saying, no, I will bear it, then I understand he's not just taking my sin, he's taking everyone's. And if that curse is not going to fall on an individual, they need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nothing will motivate the church more than realizing how sinful we are without Christ and how blessed we are because of the grace of God. Therefore, what does my life become? A spreader of the gospel. The gospel is good news when you see that you belong on the cross and Jesus went there instead. And finally, law becomes love. Listen to these words in verse 14. Jesus gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Notice the order of operations here. Grace, Jesus came. Grace, he went to the cross. I am redeemed because of that. Therefore, good works. Why am I zealous for good works? Sometimes we flip the order of operations. What I'm going to do is enough good works, and then I'm going to stand before God and say, here are my righteous deeds, therefore give me grace. No, I flip the order of operations. The order is God gave grace in faith. I received that through the gospel. Therefore, verse 14, I am zealous for good works. What is the purpose of the law for a Christian? Yes, it is a boundary that keeps us from sin, but ultimately, what does the law become for a child of God? It becomes the avenue through which we go out into the world and love God. The law becomes the vessel that we use to glorify God. He says, here's how you live, and what do I do? I take that, and I say, in honor of you, God, the one who has redeemed me through your grace, I will give you my adoration I will give you my humility and submission. I give you my life. Law becomes a way that I look at God and say, everything that I am is a gift from you. Therefore, I give everything I am as a gift back to you. When you look at the law and you say, well, God is just heaping burdens upon us, you're missing the beauty of the law. God gives us the law to keep us from evil and then to give us the way through which we glorify Him. And it's important that we get the order correct. Grace comes first. Faith comes second. Good works come third. A life purified by Jesus Christ is a life that exhausts itself glorifying God. A life that exhausts itself trying to earn its acceptance in the sight of God is one who will never understand grace and you will forever be bound under the law. That's why Titus chapter 2, in connection with Galatians 3, becomes such a beautiful passage of Scripture. Because you are redeemed through Jesus, you live your life for His glory. That's the gospel. And that is what God offers the world. Good news, you're saved through Jesus Christ. Therefore, your life glorifies God in all that you do. Now, where are you today? Have you been redeemed by the grace of God that has come through Jesus Christ? Have you seen your sin on the cross? Have you been humbled by that sight? And in faith said, I deserve death, but Jesus Christ is my hope of salvation. And then with that confession, have you been baptized into Jesus Christ so that you will be joined to the death 
the burial, and the resurrection. You be washed clean in the blood of Jesus so that, as Titus 2.14 says, you can be zealous for a life that glorifies God. Have you obeyed the gospel or are you still bound under law? If you are a child of God, are you glorifying God through your life? Or are you still living that same old way of life? This morning, the invitation is yours. Will you glorify God through your life or not? If you desire to be baptized into Jesus or repent from your sins this morning, won't you come as we stand and sing?